All right, so we're talking about photosynthesis, and we're talking about the light-dependent reaction of photosynthesis. So just so we know where we're talking, if we look at our sheet of paper, so if we look at our sheet, here's our sheet of paper. So here's my paper. I'm going to, on the very corner, I'm going to outline what part of a cell we're talking about. So let's say if I'm talking about a cell, so I'm going to draw in the corner of my paper because I don't really want this in my diagram, but I want to make sure I know what I'm talking about. Let's say this is my cell. So here's my cell. Okay, so I'm going to draw that in the corner. All right. And what part am I talking about in a cell? Um, I've got my chloroplast right? So I've got a chloroplast in a cell, so I'm going to make it too big. And inside a chloroplast, I have these disc-like structures that are in stacks. Do you remember, you probably want to just know what you're looking at. Just in the corner of a piece of paper, you're taking notes on your own paper or the back of the handout, whichever makes you happy. Okay, so what are these called, these disc-like structures? <coughs> Yeah, Madison? They're called the thylakoid. Correct, the thylakoid. So what I'm going to be talking about today is if I take just one thylakoid and I blow it up like this. I'm going to take a little corner, a little edge off the thylakoid, the membrane, and blow it up. That's what today's, that's what's going to be on your paper, okay? So let's start by talking about the thylakoid membrane. So the thylakoid membrane is like the cell membrane and other organelle membranes in that it is a phospho, it is in a phospholipid bilayer. So to remind us of the structure of the thylakoid, let's go ahead and just draw a little bit of what the phospholipid bilayer looks like. So we remember, so we've got our hydrophilic heads and our hydrophobic tails. I'm just going to make about four of these as my membrane. And I probably should make them farther apart so you have more room. All right. Okay, if I lied, I'll make five. Okay. Okay, so this is my membrane. But I'm not going to draw that all around because I want to write other stuff in there. But I want to know the shape. So I'm going to go ahead and sketch in with a dotted line what my thylakoid is going to look like. So here's... Here's my thylakoid membrane shape. So you can kind of see how I'm on the edge of that disc, okay? So now we're going to see how what we, what we know about photosynthesis fits into this disc. So what are the ingredients or the reactants to make photosynthesis work? What, what do we need for photosynthesis? Light, okay, so I've got light. So I'm going to, the very top of my paper, I'm just going to write the reaction without balancing or anything. I'm just going to write it. So I'm just going to write light. And then, of course, I have, I need water, right? And I need carbon dioxide. And then I'm going to end up making oxygen and glucose. So that's just not really balanced or anything, but that's it. Okay, so the parts that I'm going to be focusing on today are the parts that have to do with the light independent portion of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis takes place in some stages. So this is the light, did I say independent? Dependent. This is the part that depends on light. Okay, so I'm going to talk about today light, I'm going to talk about water, and then I'm going to talk about the product oxygen, where that comes. That all, that all is involved in this part of the process of photosynthesis. All right, so let's talk for a minute about the structure again of this thylakoid. So outside of the thylakoid, inside the chloroplast, there's a name for that area, that, that fluid area. Do you remember what it's called? Stroma. Very good. So I'm going to label this so I know which side. This is the stroma side. And then 
the inside of the thylakoid. Sometimes it's called the inner thylakoid space. It also is sometimes called the lumen. So I'm just going to write lumen in here. And this stroma, this fluid that the thylakoids are in, there's all kinds of stuff in there. Like there are some different ions. I've got some phosphate ions. I've got ADP. I've got ATP. I've got a soup of all kinds of things that I'm going to need. So um, just kind of keep that in mind as we go through this process. Okay. So let's talk for a minute about electrons before we can talk about photosynthesis. So this may be something you remember from physical science or maybe not, but what do we know about if I energize an electron, be it a specific element, I energize electron by heating it, or energize it in some way, what generally happens? Yeah. It'll move up an energy level, right. So I can energize an electron and it moves up energy level. And then what tends to happen? Does anybody know what tends to happen then? Well, then it tends to fall back down. And what happens when it does that, Jay? It emits light in certain energy levels, phot photon or photons of light. So if I add electrons, I can get a glow in specific colors of light that I see based upon what, what elements the electrons came off of. That's a way of identifying elements that you might learn about in chemistry. In fact, what happens in a nutshell with photosynthesis, one of the things that happens is the light energy energizes the electrons that are found in chlorophyll A. And when those energized electrons, when they're energized, they go to a high level and they come back down naturally. <coughs> and taking that energy of an energized electron, falling back down to its lower energy state and harvesting into a useful way is really what photosynthesis is all about. In fact, if I were to um, energize chlorophyll with light, but take it out of the photosystem <coughs> and just put it in the test tube, it would just glow like other things do when their electrons fall back down. It just glow and emit its, its own special color of light. Okay? But it's not going to do that because it's part of a photosystem. So we're going to draw, and it's going to be a box because most things I draw are a box. I'm going to leave a little space next to my membrane here, and I'm going to draw a little box, and that box I'm going to call photosystem 2. And I'm going to attach something to my box, which is why I have a space. Now, photosystem 2 is where, is, it's called photosystem 2. There's actually two photosystems. Photosystem 2 is the first one, but it's called 2 because it was discovered second. And what it has in it is a bunch of pigments. Some of them are chlorophyll, like chlorophyll B, and some of them are accessory pigments, like the carotenoids and the other things that help with photosynthesis. And if I, then there's a space in here that the part of the chlorophyll, or part of the photosystem, which is really important in my reaction, is called the reaction center. Reaction center. And so essentially, I'll make this bigger for you. There we go. And focus it. Okay. So essentially what happens is light is going to come into hit the thylakoid membrane and it's going to, photons of light, are going to come in, <coughs> they're my photons of light, and these other pigments that are there are actually going to sort of funnel or um, absorb and reflect in a pattern the light and get the light, the to the reaction center. So the light energy is going to sort of get funneled or focused into this reaction center. And the reaction center actually um, is also called P2. 
And the reason it's called P680 is 680 is significant. What do you think 680 might mean? Thinking about what we know about light. Yeah. Is it It is. Basically, 680 nanometers is the wavelength of light that is most, that, or is, that is absorbed by the chlorophyll A in the reaction center of photosystem 2. So that's why it's also called P680. So basically, all of this light energy is coming in of different frequencies and wavelengths. And the correct, the right, the match of the energy of the light has to match the chlorophyll A that's in the reaction center. And so in order to help it match, that's what the other pigments do, is it basically sort of, you can th it's not really a filter, but it basically funnels it so that the ones that are the right frequency hit the reaction center. Mm -hmm. To understand the concept of having the right frequency, to make it a physical thing, it's kind of the concept of resonance. All right, has anybody ever done the thing where you've pushed a little kid on a swing or you've seen a little kid try to push themselves unsuccessfully on a swing? And you know you've got to push or you've got to pump at just the right frequency or you don't go, it doesn't work. You can't go higher. So that's kind of what happens with the light. The energy of the light has to be of the right wavelength in order to do what it needs to do for the reaction center because what it does is it energizes an electron. So what happens is, in this reaction center, then what happens is an electron is energized, so a high energy electron is then emitted from the reaction center of photosystem 2. Now, so photosystem 2 loses an electron. It's called being oxidized to lose an electron. And photosystem 2 needs to replace its electron. So we're also going to talk about what happens with this here in a minute. Okay? But before we do that, let's talk about why we left this space. So there is a protein complex called the Z complex, which is attached in to photosystem 2. And what the Z complex does is the Z complex reacts with water. And what it does, it doesn't really react with water, what it does is it takes water and it oxidizes water, which is a pretty big deal, it does not happen very often. And so what happens is it takes an electron from water and replaces the electron that was lost from the reaction center. So that's the first, that's one thing that happens. And the way that it does that is that it will take, it releases oxygen from water, and that oxygen is released as a waste product of photosynthesis. And then what's left over? So I have hydrogen, I've got H2O, and the, the oxygen is gone and the electron's gone, so what is left? If I've taken oxygen and electron, what's left? Hydrogen, but not a hydrogen atom, a hydrogen ion. So what happens is that hydrogen ions are left behind in the stroma. So now I've got an elect, so the light comes in, it gets funneled through this photosystem with, from the other pigments. It goes to the reaction center of photosystem 2. It emits a high energy electron. That electron is replaced when the Z complex, I need to attach this to the Z complex, don't I? So the Z complex does this. So I'm just going to draw an arrow from the Z complex to hydrogen so I know that's who did it. The Z complex did this. I'll make it purple. There we go. So this is what the Z complex is doing. It is taking water and it's taking, emitting a hydrogen ion from water and using the electron to replace the lost electron from the photosystem and oxygen is a waste product. 
So now I've got some energy in the form of this high energy electron. So now what's going to happen is there is a series of protein channels, but they're kind of complicated, so I'm going to make them look complicated. So I'm going to make kind of like a cylinder and just kind of put some stuff around it. So I'm going to do three of these. It's not really a magic number. I just like the number three. So I'm going to make three. And so what's going to happen, oops, I'm writing on the screen. <coughs> All right, so what's going to happen now is I have a high-energy electron, and it's, as it, it's going to go, and these protein channels are also electron acceptors. They'll, they, the electrons go right to them, and they get, as they go there, they go to a lower energy state, and instead of releasing their energy as light, they release their energy by pushing a hydrogen ion through this, it's really like a proton pump, pumping a hydrogen ion through. So then it loses, so then this one loses a little bit of energy. Oh, wrong color. It's supposed to be pink. Okay, pink. Pushes a hydrogen through. <coughs> loses a little energy. So what I'm essentially doing with is causing an accumulation of hydrogen ions inside the thylakoid. So I'm creating a concentration of hydrogen ions. So now I've taken the energy of a high energy electron and now I've stored it in a different way by storing these ions inside the thylakoid. So I'll kind of just kind of like water behind a dam or something like that. Or charging a battery or a capacitor. Alright, now these pro um, these protein channels that accept electrons also have a name. These are called the ETC, which is also known as the electron transport chain. This, and they also have certain um, protein <coughs> channels called cytochromes, which is a name you need to know. It's in your written notes, and we'll talk about it. Okay, so let's pause right here and see where we are in the big picture of our notes so that we can kind of check off what we know and what we've already got drawn out. Okay, so let's start at the top of your handout <coughs> note sheet. So let's look at the top of our handout note sheet. We're going to skip the overview because that will look again at the end. So let's start with number two, um, outlining the light-dependent reactions. Okay, so number one was the Z-complex. So here it says, water is split by the Z-complex, which is attached to photosystem two. So I've got that. Here's my Z-complex takes the water and splits it into oxygen, hydrogen ion, and electrons. So yes, I've got that shown. Oxygen is released. There's my released oxygen. Electrons from H plus are used to replace those lost by photosystem 2. Yes, there's my electron replacing photosystem 2. And then I've got D, which says hydrogen ions used in chemiosmosis. Okay, we're going to address that next, so let's pause on that. And let's take a look at what it says about photosystem 2. Photosystem 2, PS2, what is a photosystem? It's a specific arrangement of pigment molecules which each trap light energy and transfer it to a reaction center, which is a designated molecule that has a certain position. Chlorophyll A is the pigment of the reaction center. The reaction center of PS2 is also P680, and that's because 680 nanometers is the wavelength absorbed most heavily in this reaction center. And then we've got P680 is oxidized, loses a high energy electron. And I've got down this little thing of oil rig because we're not all chemistry people here. And so we talk about oxidation reduction, and this is basically what we need to know. 
we need to know that when I say something is oxidized, oxidized is losing an electron and reducing is gaining an electron. So that is what you need to know about oxidation and reduction. So we can see that water was oxidized because it lost an electron, and we also see that the photosystem was oxidized because it lost an electron. Okay, and the electron acceptor is reduced because it gains an electron. So the little mnemonic to help you remember that is oil rig. And that's basically all we need to know about oxidation reduction for our purposes. Yes. Okay, why does the photo, the reason that photosystem 2 uses the elect, loses the electron, because in its reaction center, it has um, added to the chlorophyll, it has something, sometimes it's magnesium or something else, which has a lot of free electrons. And so what happens is when that energy hits it at just the right wavelength, it causes the electron to go to a higher energy state. Okay? So basically all you need to know as far as remembering is that the reaction center loses a high energy electron that is then replaced by the splitting of water. Okay, so now we're going to talk, is there any questions up to that point? Okay, now we're going to talk about what we mean by chemiosmosis. We've already kind of started it here when we talked about the electrons as they go to lower energy state are pushing the hydrogen ions um, into the lumen. So now on the side of my structure, I'm going to draw another little protein channel. Leave space over here and go to the side because we're just gonna, I got something else planned for later. All right, and I'm going to draw another little structure. But this time I'm going to attach something to it. I am going to attach another protein, which might be a name you know or heard of, which is ATP <coughs> synthase. So what happens is um, ATP synthase is attached to this other protein channel. And what it does now, we have a concentration of hydrogen ions. And so this is now a channel that will allow the hydrogen ions to flow with their concentration gradient out of the lumen into the stroma. And when they do that, then the energy that is released is then used to phosphorylate ADP into ATP. So the way we can show that process is we can show kind of a little swoopy arrow, and we can say, well, here's my ADP, oops, that's a P, plus my phosphate ion that is going to, with the ATP synthase, is going to become ATP, which we know as an important energy-containing molecule. So this is the rest of the story with the process of chemiosmosis. So this is the natural flow of the hydrogen ion back through a protein channel or with that is attached to ATP synthase. So let's look at that on our note sheet. And we see Okay, so this goes back. So here we go back to the D that we skipped before. Now we can talk about it. So hydrogen ions are used in chemiosmosis. So here's the hydrogen ion being used in chemiosmosis. And then here's chemiosmosis. Let's look at the process and see if it makes sense for what we just drew. Okay, so we have um, high energy electron is passed through a series of electron carriers, the electron transport chain, or ETC, some of which are called cytochromes. So we need to remember the name cytochromes as some of those. As each reduction oxidation occurs, some of the energy is used to power proton pumps. So remember, H plus is a proton that is being pumped through these protein channels. Proton pumps are intrinsic proteins which move protons from the stroma to the thylakoid space. A concentration gradient of H plus is established, like water behind a dam. ATP is generated when the hydrogen ion passes through a protein channel to which is attached an ATP synthesizing enzyme, ATP synthase, which will transfer to the light independent reactions. Okay, and then, so basically, this is where we are so far. We've got, and we're going to stop right here 
and we'll find out tomorrow what happens to the electron that's released from here and how that leads into the next step. Okay? Are there any questions on these steps so far? We're going to add to our drawing tomorrow. And, okay. So let me show, tell you what you can do to help yourself remember.